Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Opportunity. I am your host, Greg Elfrank, the head of marketing over at Empire Flippers. And today I am talking to Nick Jordan from Content Distribution. This is a interview long in the making. I've been wanting to literally interview this guy for almost a year at this point, but just like one thing or another just led us astray where we didn't make it happen. But the stars have aligned today and I am bringing you Nick Jordan. So if you haven't heard of him, he runs content distribution and he's publishing hundreds of thousands of words per a month, all manual with teams of writers, with teams of editors, and he's SOP the entire process where the writers themselves are doing all the on-page SEO work. I'm talking about the headers, the on-page optimization, everything and his five minute keyword process keyword research process pretty much anyone can do it you will hear me gushing a little bit over his clustering tool which i think is incredibly useful if you are doing a ton of content so give it a listen and you might just be surprised at how nick has built some massive digital portfolios in terms of traffic using pretty much no backlinks at all so if you're interested in that i'll see you on the other side and if you like this interview make sure you leave us a review give us a share helps us a ton. See you there. All right. I got Nick Jordan here with me. Nick, welcome to the podcast. This has been long in the making because apparently we are both terrible at follow-up. So my <laughs> podcast producer, Lauren, has bridged this skill gap of ours. We've been talking about doing this for months. Uh, I'm glad to finally have you on here. For my audience that doesn't know you, why don't you walk us through who you are, what you do, and your entrepreneurial journey, how you got started? Absolutely. So, hey, everybody. My name is Nick Jordan and Gregory. Super excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. My kind of claim to fame is I've taken five projects from zero to 100,000 organics a month without building backlinks, without doing technical BS. One of those ended up growing to 1.5 million organics a month and allowed the startup I was working with to go from a seed stage to a $210 million valuation led by Andresen Horowitz, one of the best VCs in the Valley. Not a bad 30 second elevator pitch you got there, Nick. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Well, that, like, how does he do it? <laughs> Stick around, you'll find out. <laughs> that is awesome. So talk to me. Uh, so you were working in a basically an SEO role at that first project, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So my story is that I actually spent my entire career outside of SEO. And I think that's what makes me so good at what I do is because I could approach it from a fresh perspective. I didn't have all this legacy Panda and Penguin and, and Google <laughs> stuff that I carried on into my career. At 20 years old, I dropped out of college. I started a startup. It didn't work. Me and my co-founder pivoted. I got to like 6,000 mer. Also didn't work for various reasons. And then I joined a startup as employee number eight. We grew to 200 people in four years, bootstrapped. Oh, that's amazing. That's especially yeah, it was, bootstrap. You know, I, it was a company in an industry I didn't know existed for a role I wasn't qualified for. And all my peers were 15 years older than me. And so I just got to learn from the best of the best at pretty incredible scale. My job was to set up reseller partnerships with companies like GoDaddy and Rackspace and AT&T and Comcast, Time Warner Cable, sell our software to their customers, average deal cycle one year. And then after we close it, it takes another year to even get it to the customers. So oh God, that's uh, really complex. <laughs> that's <just something> yeah. <laughs> so at four years in, I was like, hey, like I've had an incredible career, but as an entrepreneur, the skills that I built don't service me. You know, enterprise biz dev isn't something that a 29 year old can do a lot with if you have to build an enterprise product and enterprise support team and enterprise legal team. And I was like, I got to learn how to do marketing so I can build a SaaS startup with marketing and I can make money while I sleep and I can live in any country that I want. And so that was my five-year plan and I'm six years in and I'm just getting to that point. That's an amazing, uh, amazing story. Talk to me about your transition from an employee to running your own business. So you bought the domain content distribution, the name of your agency and kind of like your platform in a way for your other SaaS businesses. So tell me how that came about. Yeah. Like, the leap. Yeah. Like, so to learn... To learn SEO, I took a job selling SEO for minimum wage. I went from 100000 a year, high status tech job, flying to Europe once a quarter to schlucking, you know, SEO to flower shops and junk removal guys because I knew that in order to sell it. You're a salesperson then. You're getting paid minimum wage. That's more than most. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I joined, I joined an agency. I joined my friend's agency because I know that SEO is consultative in order to sell it. Yeah. You have to know it. And so I was like, if I can sell it well, I'm going to, I know how to do it. And so... 
I grew that agency's blog from zero to a hundred thousand organics a month. We didn't do backlinks. It was a hundred, 200 pages of content. And I was like, I'm onto something here. And then I did it again with doggypedia.org, grew it to a hundred thousand organics a month. I ended up selling it for 30,000. And then I was like, I know enough where I can now do this independently. So I started my company, Nick from Seattle, LLC, and we generated about $100,000 in consulting revenue before we had a website. And I saw contentdistribution.com was for sale. So I ended up, you know, I was not making much money, like a couple thousand a month. I ended up putting it on my credit card. It cost more than my car. Now, <laughs> my car didn't cost a lot, but it's still to give you some context of how much I spent at this kind of early in the stage, because I was like, this is the best brand ever for what I'm doing with SEO. I love that. That's awesome. So the way you do SEO, the thing that really stuck out to me and the reason I wanted you on the show is basically it was something you just said about how you built these things, these amazing properties without any backlinks. And I think a lot of SEOs, they tend to get just, I don't know, have this like narrow focus on backlinks. Like it needs to be 80% backlinks, 20% content, what like these ratios, right? And in my experience, like I do think backlinks are important, but I think making high quality and siloed out the whole topic cluster of content in a lot of ways is more important to me. So talk to me about that. Like why are backlinks not important to your strategy? How does it work? So I actually tried to get into SEO three times throughout the last 15 years. And the first two times I focused on backlinks and technical stuff. And what makes SEO so hard to learn is that learning effectively really requires a tight feedback cycle between implementation and results and yep. being able to isolate variables. And SEO has none of those things. And so I'm doing all this technical stuff. I'm building backlinks. I'm not publishing a lot of content. I didn't get enough results to kind of stick with this as a career. And so I ended up doing the thing we talked about earlier. The third time though, I was like, all right, I still don't understand backlinks 15 years later. I'm not like the <laughs> smartest guy. Like if I can't click a button in a WordPress plugin, then it's not happening on my website. So I really got to make this work with just content. And the third time when I focus on just content and publishing the highest quality content, for the keywords that I want to rank for, it worked. And that kind of framework that I discovered six years ago now is still in play for all of the projects we do today. I want to get into that framework, but it's funny you said that if you, like, I'm very similar, I'm very non-technical. I know a lot about like what goes into it. And I remember years ago, I was friends with tons of Black Hat SEO affiliates. And I would tell yeah. them like, oh, I would never use a PBN. And they're like, why? It's the only way. Like, no, it's not the only way. You can do all this white hat SEO stuff. Back then, that was like unpopular with SEOs. I think yeah. the has swung quite a bit in the other direction now. And I was like, well, think about it, man. Like if you're building out, say, 20 affiliate sites to any reasonable size, the amount of PBNs and all this black hat stuff, like PBNs are you know pretty gray hat, but the other stuff that they were doing are very black hat, like Snape links, all that kind of stuff. Like the just some, the technical logistics of doing this is an absolute nightmare. Like, why would you want to do this? <laughs> So my you own know, lazy and, prevents me from doing the technical black hat stuff. You know, in 90% of the value that an SEO campaign will create comes after year two. So if you yeah. do all this technical black hat stuff and then you get slapped before year two and you lose all your traffic, well, you really like that was a waste of ROI and a waste of time. 100%. Man. We have a blog post. So I've been at EF for almost seven years and two months will be seven years. And one of the very first blog posts, the blog post series I wrote was about seven years ago, and we're still getting leads today. Like average business size is like, it's fallen a little bit over the recent months with everything happening with the economy, but still around 300 K 300, 352,000, something like that. And that's all organic, you know, like I'm not paying for ads like that. It's like clockwork, incremental growth. And just because I didn't do all this shady stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I'm very long term focused. I'm always looking three to five years ahead of my career. And in order to get to the next step, I need to crush what's in front of me. And so I don't need to survive the next five Google updates. I need to survive the next 500. Right. Yeah, exactly. So let's get into your framework. Break it down for us. I mean, you don't have to give us your trade secrets or anything like that. But tell us a little bit of how this like very much content first strategy works. Yeah, I'll definitely talk about it from a high level, but if you want the trade secrets, it'll be a link in the bio of this podcast because I do actually give away all the secrets. So Excellent. let's, let's we, get people enticed to click the link. Once we pay the podcast part. sponsor fee, we will link that in the show notes. Don't worry, Nick, it's only $20,000. <laughs> it's very easy to afford. <laughs> well, no, pay, PayPal's in the mail, PayPal's in the mail. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, so my whole approach to SEO is pretty simple. I want to create the highest quality, most relevant, most valuable page of content Google could show for the keywords that I want to rank for. And I want to do that at scale. And those two things encompass everything that happens in the day to day. And it's actually, it's a good framework because, you know, if SEO is all about hacks and black magic stuff, you don't have a framework for decision making if you haven't seen a particular situation before. But if your framework for decision making is how can I create the most value for the user, you can answer almost any question that comes up throughout the course of an SEO campaign confidently. Right. Yeah. So your framework, like, are you looking to publish just as fast as possible? Because like that. It's kind of the impression I get. You're publishing, how much is it per month that your team is publishing right now? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds at peaks yeah. and valleys. But at our peak, we we're publishing 800 pages a month. Basically the entire catalog of Stephen King every month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like to say yeah. the same velocity as the New York Times. Yeah. So I want to get into the logistics of that. But so your strategy is basically just like pump out all the super high quality content that is answering the question as best as possible or the keyword query rather as best as possible. I'm assuming you're doing like a bunch of interlinking, like the whole topical map silos. Are you doing anything like that? Yeah, let's get into the tactics. But first I want to talk about why I think it works. Sure. I don't yeah, like yeah. to explain the Google algorithm in technical terms. I like to do it from a business perspective. And I think that, you know, Google has access to user engagement data like Chrome. Android and Google Analytics. And between those three, you know, they have access to the entire like software stack of analytics. Google also sees their peers using UX metrics to influence reach. Gregory, if I was like, hey, you know, Facebook engagement will influence how much reach the Facebook platform gives your content, you would say, I know that, Nick, everybody knows that. And then I go, well, TikTok does it too. And you go, I know. And then I'd be like, well, LinkedIn. And you'd be like, I know. And then I'd be like, but YouTube, and then you'd be like, I know. And so when I say that, that's how Google search works. Everyone's like, well, what happened to backlinks? And I'm like, the facts are there. So I strongly believe that Google uses user engagement metrics to influence rankings. And I think it's a primary ranking factor. And that's why I think it works so consistently. And to date, you know, the active projects that we've worked on have never been impacted by an update. Some of the projects we've worked on have got crushed after new guys took over and kind of diverged from our quality strategy. But um, you know, we're still rocking and rolling. That's the thing with SEO agencies, man. I've hired a few of them and like people that I thought really knew what they were doing. Like I'd see them do their speech or whatever, but your earlier metaphor about the black magic, the shaman <laughs> whispers to yeah. Google, like, yeah. it's so true, man. <laughs> I've had wide exposure to so many different pieces of marketing groups and marketing subcultures between media buyers, native ads, you know, SEO. SEOs are the most fun group because they're always fighting with each other. Like it's just like constant drama all the time. <laughs> you know, I have a lot to say about my peers. I don't know if I want to go into it on this call, but you I bet like, you can teach uh, me how to make the podcast to. go viral by calling some. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. I love this strategy. So one of the reasons why I love this strategy, I want to get into the tactics here, but yeah. one of the reasons I love this strategy is because a big subset of our customers are affiliate site owners, right? And a lot of affiliate sites, in my view, they treat their website kind of like a brochure and like you throw yeah. away a brochure, you're never picking it up yeah. again, no matter yeah. if you buy it or not. But if you treat it more like a magazine, then people will subscribe and they come back over and over again. There's a lot more value. So if you are doing real high quality content, it should convert. And if they like your brand that you're building, they come back over and over again. And now you have something that's super, super valuable. So I just, I love this strategy. Let's get into a bit of how you handle this. So we could start with your keyword research process, and then maybe we can go into how you actually distribute this content to your team to go and create. Yeah, definitely. So I think from a high level, in order to scale high quality content velocity, you need two things. The first is you need people who care because every single word of content writing is a liability to mess something up. Spelling, grammar, positioning, messaging, internal linking, formatting. Every single word is a liability. And so the only way that you can publish hundreds of thousands of liabilities every month that are really good and consistently better than the competition is if the folks who are writing and editing the content care. And to be honest, that's not us. You know, me and you, we look at SEO as a channel to exploit. And so ultimately, we also have a lot of other interests. And so, you know, ultimately, we're not very good content editors because we just don't care. When you look at my team, 
they're filled with language nerds. None of the people on my team are interested in moving into an SEO role. They've all spent their entire lives like teaching English, getting a master's degrees in English, and they're just ecstatic that they get to, there's some sort of business model that allows them to get paid to play in words. And those are the people that you need on your team because you know when you hire an SEO and he's an editor, well, he's just thinking about how do I get back to SEO? How do I start my own thing? <laughs> and he's not going to care as much as the people who got their master's degrees in English. So you need people who care. And then the next thing you need is documentation to hold the people who care accountable. Because what I found is that if you say something, everybody will hear it differently. If I say something today, a month later, they're going to understand it differently than what I actually said. And so if you want something done consistently the same way every single time, you need documentation that enables your team to execute at a level just as high as you or even higher, and documentation makes that work. Yeah, you're really big on the SOPs. If I remember right, you had, it was either you or one of the people on your team on the YouTube channel, they had like this huge breakdown of just insane amounts of SOPs you guys have created. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have over a thousand SOPs in our knowledge base. And I think it's one of the reasons that we're so successful is because everything that I need to happen is documented. There is a common thing that people in the SEO world think. I want to get into the keyword research thing is why I'm bringing this up because so many of my SEO friends, they'll never outsource keyword research because they're like, ah, oh, it takes like a special taste of the Google of SERPs yeah. to do that. This can't be trained. But it's like, well, you trained yourself somehow, so they can be trained. You were trained. So talk to me about your keyword research process, because I think this starts off the conversation for us to talk about the logistics of all this. I love your approach to keyword research. Yeah, definitely. And thanks for bringing that up. So at our peak, we we're publishing 800 pages a month, 45 writers and editors, and we had two SEOs. And SEOs in our organization are responsible for creating systems and processes for the content team, not necessarily doing the SEO themselves. So we've been very successful in delegating SEO to writers and editors, and they don't really understand what they're doing, but they know that they need to follow this process doc. And if they don't, Nick will be mad. And if they do, Nick will be happy. <laughs> so they just do it and it works great. You know, we hiring SEOs is a lot harder than hiring writers and editors because it's so from the gut, there's so much, you know, intuition required. It's easier just to eliminate the role altogether and just <laughs> turn it into templatable work for someone else to do. I love it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So from a high level, we do it pretty differently. When you're publishing a lot of content, doing keyword research manually doesn't work. There's a lot of parts of the process that stop working once you're publishing a lot. So keyword research breaks, content briefs break, having SEOs do meta descriptions and URLs and internal links breaks. And so we kind of had to, like, because of the constraints that we had where we need to publish a lot of content to make a lot of money, it kind of informed how we ended up executing that within our organization. So from a high level, we built this tool called Cluster AI. It's used by 5,000 SEOs by companies like Fidelity and Deal and Weight Watchers and lots of other cool brands. And it automates the keyword research process. So imagine this. Imagine we logged into Ahrefs and we typed in a keyword and we get Ahrefs is like, we have found 37,000 keywords representing a million searches a month. <laughs> well, what do you do next? The process is broken. What SEOs do is they start picking out individual keywords going, I think this goes on one page. I think this goes on another page. I think this goes on another page. And really the way that you determine whether keywords can rank together or you need to create two pages of content to target them is you have to Google both keywords and you have to see how unique the SERPs are. If the SERPs are exactly the same between keywords, well, and there's three or more websites that rank for both keywords with one page, you can also rank for both keywords with one page. You group those keywords together. And one is the main keyword, one is the variation. But if you Google both keywords and the results are completely unique and that there's no pages that rank for both keywords, well, you probably can't either. And in order to, you would need to create two pages. So that's kind of the framework for how Cluster AI works. But doing this manually across the 37,000 keywords that Ahrefs discovered is not possible. So SEOs just start guessing. They start shooting from the gut, shooting from the hip. And ultimately, they end up making mistakes because... There's slight variations in intent where Google will completely change the search, where it's not apparent by just looking at the keywords. Does all this yeah, make you, sense so far? Yeah, yeah. So these are like NLP entities, basically, what you're talking about. A lot of the optimization tools use that are clustering together is more or less what you're talking about. 
So NLP looks more on a keyword level, like college and colleges might be grouped together because like they're mm, similar yeah. words. But what this does is it scrapes Google and then compares the results. And so you actually get, it groups them by intent or what Google considers different intent. The manual picking, you're not lying about that, Matt. I remember doing my first like clustering for topic clusters and then like doing the recursive keyword research and just having these endless spreadsheet tabs open up of trying to group everything manually. Like, oh my God, man, this is, uh, <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> That's why I yeah, love so yours, a, like cut right through the noise. What's a keyword research project I can share? Okay, so picture that. So I was doing some keyword research for an online, they sell earbuds. And so I went to Ahrefs keyword tool. I typed in earbud, earbuds. And then I also did the variation with a space um, mm -hmm. for both. So we have four keywords. And it found 37,000 keywords representing a million searches a month. And like, I'm done. I just clicked export. I imported a cluster AI. And what I get back is a list of every single page of content that I need to create. We have the main keyword. We have all the variations that are going to rank with the main keyword. And then we actually have the total search volume for the page. So when we're prioritizing content, we're not doing it from like a ground, you know, like an ant level view. We're doing it from the view of here's all the pages of content we'll ever publish over the lifespan of this six year campaign. Where do we want to start? Yeah. So Cluster.ai, that's your tool for anyone out there who wasn't following what Nick just said, if you're not familiar with Cluster.ai, I've used your tool and it's super, super awesome. simple. I like it a lot. You basically just takes everything and like go, finds all the intent and brings it together. So a really, really cool tool. You said something before we started recording about how you've become amazed with this business model with Cluster.ai, with the clients that you've gotten to sign up. Maybe talk about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So ever since we launched a tool, I've been seeing a bunch of other clustering tools pop up and I just feel so bad for those founders because they're <laughs> going to figure out what I figured out, you know, after spending all the same amount of time I spent figuring it out. And it's that the clustering is a terrible business model. I've actually been talking about this internally, like it's a running joke in our organization, but this is the first time that I'm sharing it publicly about how bad of a business model all these clustering guys are getting themselves into. So hopefully I can save them a couple of years of work. Just become an affiliate for Cluster. <laughs> Trust me, you're probably going to make more money. <laughs> yeah. So here's what ends up happening. You know, people are like, eh, like I need a demo. So you give a demo and then they're like, all right, well, I don't have that much money. I'm going to publish a hundred pages in the next year. And it costs them $39 to get that hundred page content calendar. And then they churn. So, you know, I have $39 of cash flow when I get major fortune 100 brands. <laughs> um, maybe they can publish 200 pages in a year and they'll get the $89 plan, but it's very start and stop. And people who buy today probably won't need it again for another year. So right. uh, makes it sense. ends up, it's a really great product. Our agency would not run without it. And people like you, they love it. It's just a really bad business for me. Right. I'm sure it probably has a, some halo effect for the agency at least, or they might get more intrigued. I mean, that's what brought me to your stuff was that tool originally. And then I discovered all the other things you were doing with it. Like, oh shit, this is awesome. So it worked for me to become a fan. <laughs> to be fair, you're totally right. Like it does have this halo effect. We're constantly getting signups and then they get on our email list and then we promote our YouTube and we promote our Facebook group and we promote WorkLO and they read our TL. And so it's great lead generation for WorkLO and the agency, but as a standalone business, it's definitely an uphill battle. I think in order to make it really successful, I think we would need to build in some sort of page optimizer where we create a need to maintain a subscription on an ongoing basis. But, you know, for me, it's just not where my interest lies. And so I decided to build a whole new business called Work Off. <laughs> yeah, you, I think you and I talked a bit about page optimizers. You don't really use any of that, right? You just are basically using the grouping that the tool produces and making sure you mention like the word once or twice in the article, you know, each of those words. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Going back to having two SEOs for 45 writers and editors, once you get the cluster I deliverable, you have the main keyword, you have all the variations of the main keyword, you get the total search volume. And now optimizing super formulaic, anyone can do it without SEO experience. We remove kind of the intuition required. So while our editors are editing the content, they're doing a couple things. The first is, okay, so let me start with the writers. The first sure. is you're going to have all these variations and a lot are going to be pretty similar to the main keyword, same intent. And so instead of using the main keyword in the content for the 37th time, you're just going to start using those similar variations. For the variations that have different intent, you're going to use them in H2. So going back to the earbud examples, earbud might be the main keyword, and earbuds would be a variation. 
we'll just start using your buds and all the other you know similar variations in the content. But then from an H2 perspective, there's going to be like best earbuds by battery life, best earbuds for Android, best earbuds for whatever, and those could be separate H2s. And then in the editing phase, the writer probably didn't listen that well to the instructions. And so the editor will actually swap in all those variations in the main keyword. And then they'll create the URL. The URL is always just the main keyword. They'll create the meta title, meta description. You just use the main keyword in a variation. They'll use the main keyword in the H1. And then the H2s will contain variations of the main keyword, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60% frequency. Not all of them, but 40 to 60%. And this means that, you know, non-SEOs can now do SEO. And it works really well. Yeah, I love that super templated out approach. That's great. Let's talk about how you manage this content production. So you said you have two SEOs, then you have editors, then you have writers. Like, Give me the composition yeah. of what this content machine looks like in terms of the org chart. Yeah, so very early on, I knew that I needed to hire and delegate a majority of the workload because I wasn't, like we talked about earlier, I just, I have a bunch of other interests and I honestly just don't care that much. If you're on my team and listening to this, cover your ears. <laughs> so what I did was I was very strategic in the way that I built my team. I, I knew that I had to build a team in order to hit my financial goals. I left a really good tech job. So being an independent consultant wasn't scratching my itch in terms of kind of the money I was going to make or the scale that I was going to work at. I really wanted to work at increasingly bigger scales. And if I couldn't do that, I might as well just get a job. So I ended up working with 10 writers at the beginning because I knew that one of those people was going to be my editor. And the more writers you work with initially, the more service area you have to find the person who cares the most, the person who's going to go on to become your director of ops in running the whole content team. And so I hired this editor, Gordana, and then I immediately gave her all of editing, optimization, and hiring more writers. And so she ended up building the team to 45 people. She got promoted to project manager, content manager, director of everything. And so basically we would level up together. I delegate this thing. I start documenting the next thing I want to delegate. Once she masters the thing I originally delegated, she gets the new thing. And then she gives that next thing to the person below her. And so we kind of stepped up together in terms of what we work on and the scale that we work at. That's great. So you hired 10 out of the gate. Goran yeah. was in there. Yeah. In terms of writers to editor ratios, like, is there like a perfect balance of what you found that works with that type of structure? It's lower than you think. So right now we have about one editor to two writers, and sometimes we can get up to three. The reason it's lower than you think, I see a lot of people who have five writers per editor, but the editor ends up doing a bunch of other stuff, non-editing stuff. They're running writer meetings, they're meeting with their manager, they're doing one-on-ones, they're helping out with keyword research, with the enablement documentation. Also, my team is based in Europe, and these guys get 38 days of PTO per day. And so if you have five writers for one editor and your editor goes on vacation, your other editor now has 10 writers. And so in our organization, someone's always out of office. And so having a low ratio just makes it maintainable for the rest of the team. That makes sense. How many articles are the writers usually writing? They write one article per day, about 20 per month. 20 per month. And they, yes. you find, do you find like one a day is like sustainable, they're not like the quality isn't getting lower, all that kind of stuff. Man, writing's tough. I think I'm a good writer. I think you're a good writer, but writing consistently oh, for long you. periods of time, <laughs> very few people can do that. You know, very few people can write for long periods of time. And so what we typically see is that either people get promoted to editor or they end up churning out at some point. We think a lot about retention. Everything's easier if you can retain your team. There's so much built in knowledge that you have to onboard to someone else. And so, you know, we start off with 2,500 words per day and like four writers per editor. And then over the last three years, we've brought that down because for us, it's more important to get people to stay for many years than to get more words for them for three months. Yeah. So even if they're one article is say a 750 word article for the day, that's okay. You're not making them do a word quota. It's just article quota. No, they have a word quota. And the reason is, is because we just don't have like, there's this administrative overhead for managing a bunch of low output writers. And so in the beginning, managing 10 writers worked for me because I needed to hire an editor. And so like, I was okay with the workload, but today managing 10 writers that do an article a week 
with the onboarding and the invoicing and the teaching and yeah. the knowledge transfer and the meeting, the overhead is just too high for the output. So all of our writers are full time. And if they can't meet 1600 words per day, then they can't work for us. I like that. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I mean, when I was pumping out tons of content, even before EF and then at EF, I pumped out so much. I remember, I think it was the first three or four months with EF, I tallied up the word count that I had written for EF and I was like two cents a word and I was telling you offline, I was oh writing God. one cent for a word. I mean, I was getting paid well, but I was just writing so much, like just trying to you know, spread the gospel of the brand, you know, to all of these yeah. different places and like guest posts, collabs I did, just so many. My first guest post was for Fat Stacks blog, which I'm a big fan of him too. He has a similar- James Dooley, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, John Descartes, but James Dooley's cool too. John Descartes, he runs Fat Stacks blogs. I think James Dooley runs Fat Rank, which the very similar naming. Wow. They both love the fatness, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so John, like I wrote a, I think it was a 7,000 or 9,000 word guest post, all about like as deep as possible about selling a business. I remember my CEO like reading it and I was a bit anxious because like one of my first pieces with EF, and he's like, oh my God, it's a novel. And then the other co-founder is the CMO. He read it like, I love it. Like, okay, good. <laughs> Good, good. But uh, yeah. And you know, uh, how long did you do that for before you got promoted into a non-writing role? I think I was mainly a blog writer for maybe two and a half years, something like that. I did a bunch of other stuff outside of writing the blog. I would just try to dabble into everything like email marketing, blogging, webinars. I think it was after two years I started going on people's podcasts as well, just trying to do as much as possible because I got busier. And for me, like to your point about like not being able to keep up the sustainability of that kind of writing load, I got busy with other responsibilities that just kind of like naturally got added to my plate. It wasn't like a promotion, just new things popped up for me to handle. I was like, well, it's becoming harder to write content. So I'll go onto people's podcasts as a way to still get backlinks and still do content. And that was the way I kind of like solved the issue. (laughs) I love your hustle. You also seem like you take a long-term view of your career. And I think that a lot of SEOs, they're like, how can I make money tomorrow? How can I make the most money possible tomorrow? But really it's all about grinding, acquiring valuable skills, and then getting an opportunity to use those skills at a bigger and bigger scale year over year over year. Absolutely, man. I think a lot of SEOs, they get too mired down into like what you were saying earlier about it's easier to hire like a non-SEO person to even train yeah. them than an SEO person because all this legacy stuff. Like SEO yeah. is one of the weirdest marketing channels where the more you know about it, the less you feel like you're competent. <laughs> like yeah. you feel more incompetent as you start learning all this stuff, like diving into screaming frog entities, yeah. these yeah, yeah. Companies, all this stuff, you know, it's like when you first learn SEO, it's so simple. Like, oh, just blog. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> and then everyone just overcomplicates it. And yeah, you're right. Like all that stuff is important, but like 90% of it is content and backlinks. And out of that 90%, it's like 80% of that's content in my view. So I'm more in alignment with your view than the more myopic technical view that people have. You know, Naval Ravikant, he says that careers are measured in decades, not months or years. So if you're an SEO listening to this, just know that like your next affiliate website probably isn't going to get you rich. It's really about the momentum upwards over the next five years. So just focus on how can you be better? How can you create more impact? With one caveat, your next affiliate site won't get you rich unless you sell it with Empire Flippers. Just add, right. edit that in. We'll deep fake your voice to change what you said there, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> we have the technology now. <laughs> I love it. But cool, man. So you built this like big team. Talk to me about how feasible this is for the everyday SEO. So Someone that is out there who wants to replicate your strategy, they might be thinking like, there's just absolutely no way I can hire 10 writers and be producing at this level. So in their case, in their situation, how would you kind of bootstrap this kind of process for your average SEO? Yeah, definitely. So it's definitely like one step at a time. If you look at my first two projects, they didn't actually have a lot of content. The first one, logicinbound.com had a hundred pages for the agency I was working at. And then the second one, Doggypedia had about 240. And I think that 240 pages is attainable for most people over the course of 12 to 18 months to two years. And if you do good work here, this project's going to hit 100,000 organics a month. And then you're either going to sell it and have money like I did. And I sold Doggypedia. And you're either going to have cash flow to invest in the next asset or you're going to have a good enough track record where people start hitting you up. And they're like, hey, Nick, 
can you do what you did for Doggypedia from my website? And so you don't just go from one to 10 writers, you know, on your next project. You need, it's a two to three to four year process. That makes sense. And you're just slowly growing it. So this is a question. So I, I was in Beverly Hills a few months ago and I met this guy, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, really cool guy, but he has a, this website that he built. I won't give away the niche or anything, but the thing he did is very similar to what you're doing in a sense in that he just crazy amount of content, just publishing mm -hmm. all the time, every day. But one of the things he said to me that I thought was quite interesting that he does, and I never really heard of anyone else doing this. I'm curious on your thoughts on this is he would map out like the entire content cluster. So yeah. like best pants, whatever, you know, whatever random niche you can think of. And you just outline all the stuff, write all the articles and he wouldn't publish anything until the entire topic cluster was done. And I asked him, why did he do that? Instead of like drip feeding it as they got done, like, because my personal belief has always been, you should publish it as soon as possible. Like I'm yeah, not talking about like, countdown timer. Timer. Yeah. just get it going, you know, get it out there. And he told me it's because of the crawl budget. Like if you make the uh, Google crawl all of it at once at the same time, they don't have to come back to figure out what it is. And so it actually ranks faster. Do you have any experience with this? Have you ever tried this? That's super interesting. No, I haven't. And I like it. I think I might try it now. We do a drip feed for two reasons. One is, you know, you can't rank for a page until you have a page about that keyword. Um, right. And so the sooner you get it out, the sooner you start the ranking countdown timer. Two, you know, generally we work with newer websites. And so we just feel like we don't have a big crawl budget. But one of the things that we end up doing is we end up publishing this content and like the amount of broken links just like goes crazy high until the whole series is published. And then all the broken links go away because we also map out the internal links to content that is. Well, so you're linking it, even though there is nothing to be found yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> I like Operationally, that. it's a lot easier. Well, um, no, it makes figure, total hey, sense. Like, no one's going to land on this content the first three months back. anyways. But yeah. I think it's super interesting because he's right. Like the first time Google comes, they're going to follow all these internal links. And if they all just 404, maybe Google doesn't come back for a long time because they're like, eh, this guy's still figuring it out. One of the hard parts about what I do is because all my projects like are such a big scale, it means I've, I've only done like 10 SEO projects, maybe 15 over the last two years. I don't have like a huge amount of variability to just isolate a single factor and then dedicate the whole project to testing it. What I try and do is I look at the things that I think influence my prior successes and then try and keep those variables the same on new projects. So an example of that might be no dates in the URLs, no subdomains. I want to use WordPress if I can. You know, the site speed needs to be fast. I need to have like links to important categories on the homepage. And I have this set of, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 things that I think are super important. And then when I take on a new project, I'm like, all right, guys, we got to stick as closely to this as possible. And not every new project will be able to isolate and control the variables. But what we found is, oh, they're using Shopify. It turns out it doesn't matter. Oh, they got dates in the URLs. Oh, it works out fine. Oh, they got this other thing that we can't do and it still worked. And so as long as you can try and keep as many of the variables the same as possible, you'll get new random ones and it'll still work out okay. Nice, nice. Uh, if you do, I've never done any like SEO experiments myself. I actually reached out to a friend of mine who he does experiments yeah. now and again. It's like, hey, I want to do like an SEO experiment. How do you do this? And he's like, man, <laughs> you need to have like a lot of projects to make it work. I thought he was just like researching stuff, but he is literally setting up just like probably hundreds of like test websites. Like it's just insane. constantly. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. I don't think you need you a lot of web people without you're doing it. <laughs> you need a lot of websites and you need a lot of content and you need a lot of time. Yes. And like, yeah. if you have the, and like, there's probably some other stuff that like makes you special and able to do hundreds of websites. But for most people, it's not very accessible to do SEO testing. So send me his Twitter and I'll just keep up to date on his tests. <laughs> That's the easy way to do it for sure. Yeah. How do you, with so much content coming out, I know you mentioned editors. Maybe we can dive in a bit into the editing process. How do yeah. they maintain that uh, content quality? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's the people we ultimately let into our organization they all start off as writers. And so one of the hard parts about hiring external editors is that their resume says they care, their portfolio says they care, you interview them one time, they say they care, and then you hire them and they don't care. Yeah, and, classic. 
it's very hard. One of the most difficult things to evaluate in the interview cycle is how much someone cares. But if they start with you as a writer and they do good work for three, six, nine months, you can't fake caring for that long. And so when you look at all of our editors, all of our PMs, all of our head of departments, they all start off in our organization as writers. And so our organization kind of from the ground up believes in this philosophy to content quality and that it's really important to do it right. And so if you have like, if you have the time, I always recommend promoting one of your existing writers into an editing role versus trying to hire externally. I think that's the right move as well. That's what I did. I mean, me getting promoted at EF and then my own content manager that I hired originally, she was a writer for me as well. If someone wanted to start this and say, again, they're bootstrapping it, so they can't go as big as they would like to, like what you're doing, but they're starting out. Say they want to hire two writers, they'll start, or maybe three writers with one of them hopefully yeah. becoming an editor. They start off as editing. What kind of costs are they looking at to do this? Like one article a day, like, do you have a, like a cost per word kind of structure or how does that work with your team? Yeah, this is a really great question. So what we always recommend is that people kind of build a pot and a pot is one editor and it's two or three writers and you're probably the PM and you're doing the kind of the keyword research and the SEO and the, and the things of that nature. In Eastern Europe, you can find people with master's degrees in English and education for full-time roles for about sixteen to $1,700 a month. And so three of those people would be about $4,500 to $5,000 a month. If you have two writers and an editor, you can publish 40 pages a month or about 500 pages a year, and it will cost you about $4,500 a month. So sixty k for 500-page website. Yeah, not terrible, especially if it's starting to produce results. And that's another question I have for you is like, in terms of the velocity and the speed, because your projects, you know, you bust out all this content and like it ranks and it seems to be driving in a lot of traffic pretty quickly. Like a lot of newer websites I see that try to get started. It's not until like month 22, month 24 that they're even starting to see a little bit of traffic coming, you know? So how does it look like with your projects in terms of speed of rank and getting traffic? I'm really militant about the speed to kind of results. Now, when I say results, I don't mean we're going to pay back the campaign in month three. I mean that in month three, we should have a clear indicator that we'll be able to pay back the campaign in month 12. And I've developed this framework for holding myself accountable when I started my agency content distribution because I didn't want to build a shitty agency. If I couldn't control all the success factors, then I was going to quit and do something else. And now I don't do any of the project work, but using this framework, I can hold my team accountable with just by logging into Google Analytics and Google Search Console. I don't need to know anything that's going on with just two metrics I can tell. Essentially, I can tell if a project's on track because eight out of 10 weeks, traffic grows in Google Analytics. Two out of 10 weeks, it will drop, but it should grow every single month. Now, if traffic or impressions are ever flat for more than 60 days, the campaign is not working as it should. Something is wrong and we need to iterate. We probably need to accelerate a lot of the technical changes that we were planning on putting off until the next quarter. If impressions don't crease, traffic won't come. So first I'm paying attention to impressions. Is impressions creasing week over week, month over month? And then eventually I stop paying attention to impressions when that's on autopilot and I just focus my attention in Google Analytics. Google Analytics is ever flat. I go back to impressions and say, hey, hasn't been growing over the last couple of weeks. If not, then my Google Analytics isn't going to grow and I need to get in front of kind of get impressions growing again. And this should all happen after you publish about the 30 or 50th page of content. So depending on the velocity that you're publishing, you know, by month three or four, you should be growing week over week. So around 50 pieces of published content is when you start seeing kind of a tipping point happening. Week over week growth. Yeah. And so everybody knows SEO takes a long time. But it's a lot easier to be patient if every week you're growing. And it's a lot harder yeah. to be patient if like you only grow half the weeks or like less than half the weeks. You're like, are we ever going to get here? But growing every week really shows you like, oh, we just have to wait another year. But we can see it every day. <laughs> 2024 will be our year. <laughs> yeah, I like the way you also talk about how most of these campaigns make their money back on year two. Because it's kind of the what you mentioned earlier, the longer view of things almost like an investor view of this, which we have a lot of investors on our marketplace where they'll yeah. buy out these affiliate sites and they just crush it. And most of the buyers that buy affiliate sites from us that really crush it, 
they basically do like a smaller version of what you're doing where they just yeah. create a massive amount of content. Like a lot of them can't be bothered with the links. <laughs> like, so they're like, I'll just create more content. That's easy. <laughs> you know, here's what I will say about links. Cause I've been, you know, I trash backlinks quite often in my like social content and on this podcast. When I work on higher domain websites, my traffic will grow faster and I'll rank higher with less content. Right. But when I talk about why I don't build backlinks, it's because what I found is that whatever kind of backlink profile the brand earned through general brand marketing, podcasts, sponsorships, creating content, hustling from their friends is enough to get the SEO outcome that they're looking for. It could be better if they had more backlinks, but it's not necessary. And if I had ever got to a point where I couldn't deliver an outcome that I wanted to deliver, I would have figured out how these whole backlink things work. But so far that hasn't happened. So I've just kind of been pushing it off and off and off. Do you think there's a difference? Like, So I agree with you what you said there. I've been trashing backlinks on this podcast too, because I think backlinks get too much love in our sphere of friends. Yeah. But I, I'm a fan of making backlinks. So don't get me wrong, audience. Like I think backlinks are super important as well for a variety of reasons. But let's say we were doing this model that you're doing. Yeah. Instead of being a tech startup client or someone who's funded or even a bootstrap company that's selling like their own products, let's pretend it's an affiliate site. In okay. that case, do you think that if they do everything right still, like they're trying to provide the best value that we talked about earlier, that they'll earn enough backlinks naturally without really having to focus on it too much? Or would you still suggest for them to focus a little bit on backlinks? So my like Doggypedia was like a DR9 when it hit 100,000. And the extent of the backlinks I did was I built the social profiles, I did the citations, and then there's like random websites that you can like sign up for and like post a comment and it will like get you a backlink. So like WordPress.org is like a DR90. And I'm like, help with this theme on Doggypedia.org. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Scammed. Got him. That was a classic GSA, sir. Like, yeah. <laughs> so if you're doing your own project, like it makes sense to just do it because maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but it's only going to take you like a couple of days to get all these like low hanging like things. But when I do client projects, like I just don't have a scalable way to like acquire actually valuable links that I think are important. So I just skip it all together. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. So that should put some confidence in some people. Cause I know when you said like you going on podcasts would naturally get you there. I knew immediately the affiliates who don't want to talk to anyone, like I'm never doing that. <laughs> like, so I guess yeah, I need to buy yeah. that. So that, that's good to hear. Well, so with Workello, it is my own personal project. And for the first time ever, I'm investing in backlinks. And so I'll call it out just because <laughs> someone will listen to this podcast and go, Nick sure spent a lot of time talking about how he doesn't build backlinks for someone with a lot of backlinks. <laughs> so, no, for but, sure. You know, I, I think it's you're a, not going to like the acquisition strategy. Yeah. So let's talk about. I want to get on, man. Your new software. I keep calling it Trello, and I uh, know it's not <laughs> called Trello. <laughs> and I like my brain slips, and I like shit. What was it? It's Trello. No, it's not Trello. Workello. So yeah. talk to me about Workello because I think this will solve probably the next question that people have of how do they actually find and build these writers. Yeah, so I was working on this project where we were publishing 800 pages a month. And basically the client was like, Nick, your budget's unlimited. I'll pay you for any incremental content you can publish. And so the amount of money I could make was just limited by the number of good writers and editors I could hire and manage. And so I spent like a thousand hours figuring out how to hire writers on autopilot because it was the number one growth lever for the amount of revenue that I would make. And we like nailed it. Like we have a very easy system where, you know, I just log into a dashboard every day. I have a sourcer and I just click, do I want to reject people or do I want to test them? And if I want to test them, they get a test. I sit back and relax while they take the test. And when they submit it, it just shows back up in the dashboard. So for me, it's very autopilot. And at the same time I figured this out, I saw everyone in the SEO community going, it's impossible to hire writers. Of like yeah. everyone's plagiarizing, everyone's using AI. This writer I hired who was good for the test article is no longer good. I spent $1,000 on writers with great portfolios who ended up turning in garbage. And so the delta between how easy it was for me and how hard it was for everyone else told me that like, hey, like I should just let other people use my system so they can just go from zero to a thousand hours, you know, in three minutes by just filling out some forms. So we launched that about a year ago. 
And we have some really cool brands using it. Copy AI is using it. We have a publisher everybody here knows that probably even your parents know using it. I can't drop their name. And yeah, we've evaluated 35,000 candidates for content teams. So how does it work? Like, how do you, like you mentioned a test. So let's start there. What kind of tests are you giving these writers within the tool? Yeah. So the test is super important because, you know, writers will submit portfolio content that's been edited by someone else. And it's never clear how much editing it took to actually get it live. And oftentimes what we found is that it took a total rewrite. And so I think there's this whole class of writer that submits one paid article, they get fired, the company rewrites it. And then that writer uses it in their portfolio for the next job they scam. <laughs> and so what we do is we post job ads where the writers we want to hire hang out. So we have a big Eastern European team. And so we're constantly posting on the national job boards in the Balkans region. So ex Yugoslavia countries like Serbia, Montenegro, and then even like Armenia. And I don't know, as an American, I'm not super good at European geography, but <laughs> that's our national pastimes geography. I, I feel you. <laughs> You know, I'm from the West Coast. We only have three states on our side. And then by the time we get to the East Coast, it goes up to like 27. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you got to learn about Europe, too. And I'm just like, I'm still <laughs> learning where New Jersey is. I have one like, step ahead of you. Alaska has the easiest. Uh, <laughs> just Alaska and just Canada. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no idea what's going on there around Arizona. Like, it just it was like 10 of those guys. So we post a job ad where the writers that we want to hire hang out. And then writers find the job ad, they complete their application on Workello, they appear in the hiring dashboard, and then with one click, I can send them a writing test. And the writing test is about three to 400 words. It should take the writer 30 minutes. And it allows you to test them on quality, formatting, and like internal linking and external linking. Designing the test is super important. What I see is a lot of people do incorrectly is they put the test on the application form and writers are applying for 30 jobs at once. So if your test is up front, they just don't do your test. What you want to do is you want to build a little bit of trust and like a relationship with them before you ask them to do work. And so we make it very easy to submit the application and then we ask them to take the test in the next step. And that increases our test take rates. The other thing we do is, you know, the more comprehensive your test is, the less likely people are to take it. And so we just make sure that it can be done in 30 minutes by someone who's qualified to do the job. And is it like a full article or are you just having them write like a basic, like just say a five? Intro. Like yeah. Just an intro. Okay, cool. Yeah, That's fair. I, I, we are I asking people to do free work. I think I'm an ethical person. I understand that unethical people do like spec work. You know, they hire using yes. spec work and, <laughs> and they end up asking people to do, you know, days or multiple days of work for free to earn a shot at a job. And I actually think that is pretty unethical. But at the same time, I've spent too much money on content I can't use. So, you know, I think the 30 minute test is the best of both worlds. It's a minimal time investment. And then we, yeah, uh, and plus it's just an intro. I mean, you're not publishing, like you're just going to publish a paragraph, <laughs> right? That's fine to me. I was going to say when I was doing freelance writing, I would, when I started like finally getting above one cent per word to the miraculous ivory tower, two cents per word, <laughs> I, 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 what well, I would do, I would how to double charging. your income overnight. Yeah. Yeah, man. I should have sold a course on it. In fact, I did sell yeah. Kindle for like a thousand dollars a month as a freelance writer. I actually had an internet guru promote it. I made like two grand that month. I thought like I'm going oh, to be rich. Here comes the Lambo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, one of the things I told my clients was if you want me to write a 500 word blog post, I can still write it for one cent, but anything over 500 words is two cents. Then they would be like, yeah. well, what do you mean? But that's more words. That's not the way like bulk selling works. Like, no, you don't understand how articles work. It's harder to make a more, a longer, interesting article because you have yeah. to know a lot more about the subject. <laughs> mm-hmm. With a 500 word article, you only need to know like two or three interesting facts to spin a story out of that, right? Like as you get bigger and bigger, like more in-depth pieces, it actually becomes harder to create. So I think what I, that's a long way to say that I think it, you having them do an intro makes total sense to me. I, and any writer would do something like that. Do you have any other advice when it comes to selecting these writers or does Workello kind of give you just like the step-by-step guidelines, like as you go about doing this? Yeah, there's a couple other things that you can do, whether you use Workello or not, that I recommend. So the first is that, you know, with ChatGPT, there's an increase in AI content, people using AI content to take the tests. So we rolled out plagiarism detection and AI content detection to try and, you know, help employers identify those people. But if you're not using Workello, just go use the existing tools on the market. The next thing you should do is you should do an interview. 
everyone's like, oh, you don't need to do an interview with writers. I saw Kevin Meng say this the other day. I think Kevin Meng is incredible. This is one of the areas we disagree. I know. Because... <laughs> I'm, I'm very good friends with Kevin, so I'm going to make sure he, he only hears that part of this episode where I said I don't. <laughs> I love it. There's very few people I look up to in the content game and Kevin Ming is one of them, but we agree on like 99%. And the one thing we disagree on is interviewing writers. And the reason is, is because people can spend all day on taking your test and it can be the best test that you'll receive. But if they spent four hours doing it and it was only supposed to take 30 minutes, they're not going to be able to keep up with the workload. So during the interview, yep. we spend the first half selling them because I think employer branding helps you attract better people who will ultimately make your life as an entrepreneur easier. I could talk more about how important the team is later if we want, but we spend the first half selling them on why they should join our company. Oh, our projects are so exciting. We have 38 days of PTO. Your managers are so nice. And then we spend the last 15 minutes doing a chat interview where we mute each other and we just talk and chat because we want to know their conversational English. Ooh, Can you write good content or decent conversational English on the fly? And if you can't do that, then you probably can't keep up with the workload. I like the taking part of the interview to an actual written format. That's interesting. I've never heard of anyone doing that. That's cool. How well, long do you... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say one of the great ideas from the non-SEOs on my team. <laughs> Though they always come up with the best ideas. <laughs> yeah. SEOs are still Googling it. The other people yeah. are actually coming up new yeah. ways of doing something. <laughs> So with these writers, one of the things that I've seen and when I was freelance writing way back in the day to even now with my SEO friends doing affiliate or doing a lot of content, say for their e-commerce store, like having these writers kind of like herding cats. So you mentioned churn <laughs> with your organization. And I say that fully recognizing I am one of those cats with shiny object syndrome as a writer. So how long do these writers tend to last before they're just like, I'm done writing on this or do you have people that stay with you for two years or is it more like six months before you need to refill that roster? Yeah. So I was just checking our LinkedIn stats. LinkedIn like gives you a retention report if you pay enough and it's three years. So our retention is actually oh. pretty good, but it's based off of like, I'd say we promoted at least 15 people from writer into other roles. And once we found in our organization, once you get promoted into like out of writing, you like don't leave so far. We're only four years in, but we have very high retention once you get promoted. For the writers, it's, you know, great writers. It really is hurting cats. Like writers are by default, I think, like depressed people. And I think <laughs> all of them got into writing because they want to create, you know, Harry Potter fan fiction. But then I'm like, hey, you have to write about like car transmissions. And they're like, mm. they're like that's not why I got into writing. <laughs> First of all, Nick, I'm very offended that you would uh, expose <laughs> the depression of my people. Second of all, is Warhammer 40k fan fiction, not Harry Potter fan fiction. <laughs> oh, well, Warhammer. Warhammer is cool. Like, I, I actually watched the <laughs> fan created content on YouTube too. Like, some of it's uh, like. I've gone too deep into the lore, man, for the Emperor. <laughs> those like it's skull cool. soldiers or death soldiers, or whatever they're called, are like. Yeah, okay, it, so. It's the yeah. It's like a great series. We could go on and on about We'll have a second podcast about Warhammer. Talk to me about the promotion of writer to editor in terms of what you're paying. You might have said it earlier, but is it like a significant jump in terms of their salary? Like, what is it about them becoming an editor that makes them stick around longer? Yeah, to be honest, it's not a significant jump, but I would say a lot of writers just like don't want to write. It's crazy, but like a lot of writers hate writing. And so if you can promise them this promotional path into editorship, you can actually get really great writers to join your team. And then when you promote them, you just like made their career. You're the one who got them out of writing into editing and that's their new kind of base level now. So they really like it. You know, editors just get to do more stuff. There's more variety. You know, they get to edit, they get to do keyword research, they get to prepare the enablement documentation. They get to be kind of in a manager role where they're managing the writers underneath them. So it's just yeah, more varied and it's, it's a career progression. Yeah. That makes sense. When do you know when you want to create a new pod of editor and writers? Like, do you have a system for that? It's just based off of cash flow. Like, I'm constantly reinvesting back into the business. And, you know, I just, like, all the money we make this month, I want to spend a lot of it in <laughs> scaling the team. You know, just kind of the level that I'm at isn't interesting. It's only interesting if I'm, like, 10 levels above. So, you know, it's all about the three to five year plan. What do I need to do today to be at the scale I want to be in five years? And it's a lot of reinvestment. So 
you know, if your clients want to give you more money, that's a good time to spin up a new pod. If your SaaS is making more money, that's another good time to spin up a pod. So it's more based off of economic potential than anything else. That makes sense. So as soon as you have the cash available to hire more, you'll do it. Because I mean, effectively, that speeds up your entire content production by having that. So that makes sense to me. Yeah. We've developed a pretty tight correlation between like content and like results out. And so if I want more results, I know the number one thing I need to do is just publish more content. I love the simplicity of it. One thing with Workello, and I was confused on this, and I might still be confused on it. So some of our audience might be confused on it too. With Workello, if someone uses it, you guys don't go out and actually publish it, say on pro blogger job board or something like that. They have to do that, right? Like. Yeah. What you've created is basically like a, almost like a marketing funnel for the writers to come through those job boards, right? That's exactly right. It's like a CRM, but instead of for sales, it's for hiring. And to be honest, we still get most 50% of the people who sign up think we're a marketplace. And I just don't know how to yeah. deal with it. There's even a section on the homepage that says better than a marketplace and then links out to all the reasons we're different. <laughs> and so you're not alone. Yeah. I don't think I saw that page or maybe I did, but in my own marketing career, I've had those experiences where I've told like what disqualifies a business for sale with us, for example, pages and pages, blogs and blogs of mentioning it like everywhere, like where you're submitting everything and people still like get this wrong. And granted, sometimes we have some out of date stuff. Like we have one out of date thing we need to update that was like tucked away <laughs> that we have to find yeah. and update. But uh, it's just sometimes you just can't educate. <laughs> like this, you know what it is? is because great. this product category doesn't really exist in the SEO space. It's a talent assessment platform for automating like skills-based assessments. And like mm -hmm. there's no competitors. You're either a content marketplace or like a content agency. And so we just look similar enough to a marketplace where people think we're a marketplace. Yeah, um, it actually getting off a little bit at first. So it makes you sense. know, getting the candidates is the easy part. It takes just as long to post a job ad on Pro Blogger as it does on Upwork. But you know, managing the candidates and kind of assessing them is where you spend all your time. So we feel like we're solving the most important problem. And then everyone wants different types of writers. So some people want recipe writers. Some people want chemistry writers. Some people want fake penis writers. And you, you <laughs> find those people I'll in different places. <laughs> A close friend of mine I used to freelance right for, <laughs> unbeknownst to him, as it turned out. <laughs> and marketplaces just aren't going to give you that variety. What we found is that the best place to source niche writers, generalists are easy. Pro blogger, LinkedIn, Reddit, Facebook groups. If you want niche writers with specific experience, there is no job board for software development writers. There's no job board for writers that have built a log cabin. You need to go to Facebook groups into interest-based communities. And that's where you're going to find the people with experience and passion that you're looking to write about. So if you're writing about backyard barbecues, you know, there's a hundred thousand person group called like dad's barbecue with a bunch of dads who are underemployed and bored who would actually <laughs> love to write about barbecues. And that's the best place to find barbecue people is interest-based communities. So that niche you pick, I don't know if you picked it at random and if someone's random. listening, they might think what a boring niche, but there is actual barbecue <laughs> YouTube channels that are all about this and they're hilarious. <laughs> I have some friends who got me into watching a few of them. They're genuinely entertaining. <laughs> so if so you're you, about Pokemon, you know, anything. yeah, you know, interest-based communities are the best place to find niche-based writers. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, well, we're wrapping up, but before I get to the rapid fire questions, I do want to ask you kind of a two for one. You've built these tools. It sounds like your tools are taking advantage of some of this AI stuff that's happening, but I know you've also pushed back a little bit on people who are using these AI writing tools. So what is your yeah. general thought on AI in general for the SEO world? And also separately to that, what's your thoughts on the general <laughs> SEO trends? What do you see happening down in the future? Yeah, I mean, ChatGPT is definitely like the trend and I think it'll be dominate the discussion for perpetuity, which is fine. Honestly, we needed a break from backlinks and like canonicals and <laughs> schema. So finally something new to dominate the SEO conversation. Well, Yandex um, already is trying to yeah, go Yandex. top spot. <laughs> you know, I'm watching and waiting because going back to what I said earlier, like all the values created in year two and beyond. So I need to survive the next 500 Google updates, not the next two. And I just spend too much on my campaigns to like lead the pack here in terms of testing on either my projects or client projects. 
I think that Google has a lot of incentives to penalize AI content. So the first is that you've already seen AI content sites being slapped all throughout 2022. So that's nothing new. The second is that open AI is now, you know, they're going to become some sort of competitor to Google. And one of the biggest, I guess, reasons to buy chat GPT is for SEO. And so if Google can remove that reason to buy chat GPT, they're kind of starving what will become one of their competitors of revenue. You know, there's not a lot of other use cases for chat GPT that people are willing to pay for outside of pumping cheap content into the service. So if Google shuts that down, OpenAI loses revenue. I think that's great. The third is that Google has some sort of existential problem. It's not sustainable for 100 million webmasters to publish 100 pages a day. It's not sustainable for like the internet as being a good place to like be a part of. And it's not sustainable for Google's index. So I think between those three reasons, Google will slap a bunch of... Here's what I would do. If I was Google, I'd slap all the AI sites just to buy me a couple of years, make people scared <laughs> to figure out what to do next. Because I think, you know, I've been watching Sam Altman and he says that eventually AI content will become indistinguishable from written content. But there's this transitionary period where being able to identify the difference is important. But long term, it's going to go away. So if I was Google, slap everybody, buy me a couple of years to figure out what to do next. <laughs> Luckily, OpenAI is making a watermark for uh, Google to help them out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's another thing. If I was Google, I'd be like, hey, Sam Altman, I'll give you $100 million a year to give me that watermark. Right. Yeah. It just seems like... So I, I'm a bit different on my take. I think AI is good for certain SEO stuff. Like, I don't think you should ever use the raw output. I think you should yeah. still be editing it. But I also take a different view in that I don't think AI is just for SEO. So for example, we use ChatGPT to basically read an entire blog post of ours, summarize it, turn it into repurposable content for social media, which has no algorithm for this type of stuff, right? We're not trying to yeah. rank, we're just creating content with it brainstorming, outlining, brief. So I see a lot of other use cases, though. I get where you're coming from. I, I think that's probably wise to not be the trailblazer on this because trailblazers in SEO are usually the people who uh, burn. <laughs> so, yeah. That tends to be the trend with most of them. So I think that's probably a wise move. In terms of like OpenAI itself, I think Google might just like launch out Lambda because I imagine Lambda is like more yeah. powerful than open AI. And they're like, Go okay, ahead, yeah. we penalized the open AI watermark. Now here's Lambda SEO. Let's go crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But we're at the end of the interview. I want to ask you three rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. What is the best hidden growth opportunities in your opinion for SEO today? Publish better content than your competition and focus 100% of your attention on that. I think it's still slept on. I think people are still trying to hack the system and ultimately those people are going to get worse results than people who do the work. Agreed. What tools or resources would you recommend for entrepreneurs who want to improve their SEO? So Ahrefs for SEO keyword research, Slight for documentation, Airtable for content management, Cluster for keyword research, Workella for hiring writers, originality.ai for, you know, determining AI content, There's probably a couple others. Or Kello, maybe cluster.ai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I uh, uh, you did say, yes. I was waiting for the joke, but you ruined the joke. Well, twice is better. So <laughs> that's right. you know, it's yeah, all about it. repetition. All right. Um, Hardest question. What has been your funniest moment since you started working with an SEO? Oh man, we ranked above Instagram for contact Instagram. That was probably my funniest. <laughs> oh, that was the leads. <laughs> we did not have an offer for those that audience, but it was on that first SEO project I took to 100K and kind of the learnings that I learned there like are still in play today. Like I analyzed why I was able to take the rankings and honestly, it was because I was able to, I was perceived as providing a better experience to users because they'd spend more time on my page than Instagram's, which was like one sentence. You cannot contact Instagram. And mine was like, well, here's all the ways you might be able to. And I gave people hope. And so they spent more time on my page than Instagram's and Google rewarded me for that. So that is no pretty hilarious. Value, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, if you ever start an Instagram clone, you've got the perfect gateway page. Like just like do a no code bubble, like clone of Instagram on the page. Or maybe I have a better offer audience fit for the Empire Flippers audience. And I'm well positioned to educate them on how to contact Gregory. <laughs> 
Just send him some Warhammer Here's his memes. personal phone number. Here's his girlfriend's <laughs> phone number. Here's his mom's phone number. It won't work with a phone number. It says I do the digital nomad thing. I basically have burner phone numbers every time I go to a different country. In retrospect, that was a terrible idea of mine. I should have kept a USA phone number. So I yeah. lost my Facebook ad account to those because of oh, some no. random course um, that my account was originally associated with. But and also in hindsight, like this does look kind of suspicious. Like I'm changing my phone number like every few months. <laughs> so, I'm on the same guess, tip. And yeah. you know, I think I'm like losing like one fun away from like my business going bankrupt because I can't get into any of my systems. Uh, oh, dude. Two factor authentication. So I, I hear it is, it is rough. Last time I was in America, I literally went to T Mobile and had like a 30 minute conversation with the dude about my situation. And so now I just pay like $80 a month to keep this phone alive that has my <laughs> US SIM. And it's just like the most reliable way. But like I refinanced my house uh, last year and I literally couldn't send money to pay the escrow for it because of two factor. And I told the baby, like, I can give you anything. My second grade teacher, my favorite pet, the color yeah. that I loved when I was three, They're like, nope, needs to be your US phone number. Like, why? I haven't owned this phone number in like eight years. <laughs> Like, why is this I, my identity? <laughs> every time I wire money, I'm like, hey, mom, you're going to get a text code. And then she messaged me back like three <laughs> hours later. Me. She's like, I'm looking for it. I'm like, no, mom, it was three hours ago. <laughs> Jeez, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, you know, the pain. Well, cool, man. Yeah. If someone wanted to connect with you or your team at Content Distribution and learn more about what you guys are doing, what's the best place for someone to contact you? Yeah, so check out our YouTube channel, check out our Facebook group, and check out some of those 5,000 word guides I mentioned in the beginning of the video. It walks through step by step with screenshots and videos, exactly how we kind of you know, scale to 100 plus pages a month. If you only want to do 20, it'll work for you still. Awesome. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure. Gregory, thank you so much. I'm super glad to be here, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share what I've learned. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace, or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business, and you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review. Give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.